this? Okay. Right now, we're going to be learning chapter 16. It's a great chapter. We're going to be learning about meditation, focused meditation, understanding and appreciation of what's around us and how to focus on that. Right now, we're at a crossroads in chapter 16, where we're going to be heading. And in order to see the direction, I'll start with a little bit of a review. Um, we came in, and first of all, Isabel, uh, did you, was the, the geeks came in? Were you, are you able to? Yes. Oh, good. Yes, okay. that's why I just did a test. They came in in the middle of the night. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Wow. And left me a message saying they couldn't test because I wasn't there. Well, it was the mm. middle of the night. Oh, my gosh. Mm. Okay. Well, it works. I'm glad. Okay. So we came into Tanya months ago, months ago, um, as if we're going into the Alta Rebbe, to the first Chabad Rebbe, with our problem. Our problem is, what is wrong with us? <clears throat> we can't figure ourselves out. One day our mood is like this. The next day our mood is like that. Who are we? What is, it, what is our identity? So what we were introduced to is the duality of our souls. We have a godly soul that wants godly things, that is selfless, that thinks about the greater good, that has a drive um, uh, that is for God. And then we learned about the animal soul, the natural soul, the, uh, the soul that is more thinking about itself, putting itself first. Um, and that really was section one. It was in order to understand the godly soul and animal soul, how they work, we went into understanding the sefirot, the, anim the uh, soul capacities, the soul powers, the behavior of the soul, how it extends itself, how it communicates itself through its thought, speech, and action. Both the godly soul has that, the animal soul has that as well. And then we continue to explain, now that we understand the two souls, chapter nine went on to explain, now let's understand the meaning of a tzaddik, rasha, and benin. The tzaddik is one that is fully in control, uh, the, the godly soul is fully in control. The rasha is one who the animal soul is fully in control. Meaning it's weak, it gives in to whatever it's thinking, to its temptations, it speaks whatever, it is on impulse. Then we have the Bainani that's struggling. The Bainani is in between that listens to both, but can always focus, can always control and have its impulse um, in check. So it has impulses, but those impulses are in check. So that's how we saw them play out in the Tzadik Rasha Bainani. Last week and in chapter uh, 15, we learned that even in Bainani itself, there is um, a, a few types of Bainini. There is a Bainini that struggles more, that is always pushing itself to be doing, to control itself, etc. But then you also have a default <laughs> Bainini, which means it's a Bainini who by default <clears throat> does what's good, does what's right. It's easy for him. And we learned last week that he has to kind of push himself. He can't remain in a stagnant position where things are easy. He needs to keep on growing, keep on pushing, um, going beyond his nature or her nature. He needs to dig deeper. The way to do that, we ended last class by saying you do that by either meditating on God. So meaning how do you get yourself to, to push yourself to, to a place that's more uncomfortable, to a place that is out of your comfort zone? Like we learned that the people would, would it was considered study learning for the 101st time. When things are easy, um, you need to grow to a place that it's pushing yourself beyond your norm, beyond your routine, beyond your default. So we said you do that by either meditating on the greatness of God, and we'll get to that more in this week. The, this meditation, when you focus on, on Hashem, it will develop emotions, uh, feelings of love towards God, or feelings of um, reverence and respect and awe, and that inspires us to do our work, inspires the Bainini to keep his work and, and to grow his work. But another way we said was to activate a latent love, a dormant love that we already have by nature, by inheritance. And that just needs to be activated. It needs to be triggered. We already have it. And it's just buried in our soul. And when it's activated, it's able to get our emotions on board. So the first way that meditation that will lead to the feelings that get drawn in 
that would be what we're going to be focusing on in the next two chapters, 16 and 17. The second way, which is um, uncovering and digging and finding that love that we already have and activating it, and hopefully that will get us to, to inspire us to grow beyond our norm, that will be chapters 18 all the way through 25. So we're going to get to that in a few weeks. Um, but what we learned, what we've been learning is, and just back up a little bit, we learned some tools. Today we're going to be learning a new tool. In already chapter 12, uh, the first tool was given to the Benini in his avodah, in his service. And actually, for those that have a cup of water or juice or soda with them, we're just going to do a blessing, and it goes like this. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam she'akol niya bidvaro. If you're unable to hear me, someone just uh, speak up. I see my mic has a low battery, so I'll, I'll keep on running it until it could go no longer, and then I'll just switch to the, the audio of the computer. So the first practical tool that we learned for the Benini was to have self-control. We learned the idea that the mind by nature rules the heart. In Hebrew, the words were moach shalit al halev, that we have the ability to control our impulses, and that we have by nature, we have by, by birth. So now if we would come into the Alter Rebbe after he gave us that tool, the question he would ask for us is, are we practicing this impulse control? And honestly, we, hopefully we would answer the honest with honesty and say, yes, we are. But then he would ask us, how does it feel? How's it going? And if we were honest, we would say it's hard to constantly be in control, to never give in to our impulses, to never uh, to keep our, 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 our thoughts always in check and our actions always impeccable. So it's the idea that both on the outside, which is our behavior, for that to be always crystal and, and, and well and perfect, eventually it gets hard. It gets exhausting. So what we're trying to get to now is to get our insides, our emotions, and our mind on board also. So that it's not that uncomfortable for our behavior to be there, our outside, because our inside is somewhat going to be on the same, speaking the same language. And I've given the example, it's like two ends of a rubber band, one end of a rubber band being our outside, the other end of the rubber band being our insides. So it's our behavior and our emotions and feelings and thought and, and, and mind and, and our way we think. And eventually, if, if we're pulling our behavior to go in one direction, to be perfect, but our emotions and our feelings are not going along with it, it stays where it is. It has the same impulses that are, that are not appropriate. Eventually what happens is it stretches, it stretches. And sometimes it could either snap, which means a person goes crazy and say, I can't do this anymore. Or what, what more naturally would happen is it reverts back. Eventually it'll just, you kind of let go a little bit and it'll go back to where it is. And what that means, just the way we have it, is many times that people is feeling inspired, a person is feeling inspired, coming from Shoal, on the high holidays saying, I'm going to change, this year will be the year. And before they know it, they're doing the same schmutz and shtus that they were doing before, before they went to synagogue or before they decided to change. So one of the reasons is they may have been able to do it maybe even for a year or two. And actually, I was just speaking with someone who went to yeshiva growing up in Israel. And he was always doing what he had to do, always doing it. Eventually, he just dropped it off. And I'm actually not blaming him. I don't even judge him at all. I don't, I don't think it's his fault or anything. There's nothing. He's a great guy. It was just over a while, it was just his behavior. He was doing, going through the motions, but his feelings weren't there. And eventually, it just it snapped. They went back to, to a place that, that we, we don't want him to go or her to go. We want them to grow always. And eventually, if there's a regression, uh, they, they, they drop what they took upon themselves in spiritual work. Um, 
it, it's it's not it's not ideal, of course. So it's almost like just to explain it, if you if you have the behavior here and you have our emotions there, even if we're raising up our behavior, eventually if the emotions are not going to be raised up, there's going to be that constant tension that is not healthy. So what we need to try to do now in chapter 16 is we're also going to be tapping into the reserves, tapping into the inside, and try to raise up our emotions to be on board so that it's, it's some, there's no tension there, that it, they're on the same wavelength, that they're, they're, they're speaking the same language. So here is a new tool that will be introduced in chapter 16, that it's beyond the impulse control that we learned already in chapter 12, which we could do, we could do, but eventually it gets exhausting and, and how long can we stop those, how long can we ignore those impulses? Now it's trying to tap into those impulses and, and, and try to develop them to be more positive. So it's to change yourself over time, not only to prevent your behavior from going haywire, it's to change your emotions and the impulses from the mind that's popping up, change those so that the impulses are gonna be better and not gonna be dangerous to always be fighting them. Um, and it's saying basically, God, I don't want to give you just my behavior. I wanna also give you my emotions. I want my emotions to be wanting the same thing. I wanna be on board fully, wholeheartedly, meeting with my heart. So it's not just when a spouse says, could you do this and say, okay, I'll do it. It's running to do it with that emotional excitement and exhilaration for doing what's right. So that's where we want to try to get to in chapter 16 and 17. And we do that by creating, oh, sorry, we do that by having the feelings, getting our feelings on board. And those feelings are created by our thinking. Like we know from chapter three already, uh, we actually gave the metaphor of a parent-child relationship, that the mind is like the parent that develops and gives birth to the child, which is the feeling. Whatever we think about, will be what we feel. So it starts with the mind. So we're going to be trying to meditate our mind on God that eventually will get our, our heart and our feelings on board and excited toward, toward it. Um, so we're trying to be more proactive here because al Rebbe is saying, let's delve deeper so that it's not hard all the time. So instead of meditating only when it's reactive, that I my 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 heart wants this and I know it's wrong and I'm therefore I'm going to try to focus and control myself more as a reaction to try to do the right thing. Over here, we're going to try to be a little more proactive, which is let's meditate, not only in a time of danger, but let's meditate on our own. Let's spend five minutes to meditate in order that we get our mind in a good place so that our feelings are in a good place so that our behavior comes more natural instead of it being a fight. So what's interesting is, so great, if you have your mind on board, you know what you're called? You're a tzaddik. If you have your mind and your feelings on board and wanting the same thing as your behavior, you're a tzaddik then. So over here we're saying it's not going to be, we, we understand that the feelings and the, the mind meditation are not going to be as intense as a tzaddik's. Because that's not our goal. That's not our range. We said before that to be on the level of a tzaddik is really a gift from God. So it's not going to be as deep and as, as elaborate, elaborate as a meditation by a tzaddik. Over here we're, we're in Hebrew, we're going to call it more in chapter 16, a tevuna, which is more of an appreciation. So it's not this uh, complex, deep meditation that we're able to attain right now. That's really on a tzaddik level. We're going to be more just to get an appreciation of what is going on here, an understanding and recognizing and appreciating God. So instead of lack of, uh, the lack of appreciation is taking things for granted. You have this, you don't. I'm just doing it because I was told to do it. But over here, what we're trying to get to in chapter 16 is to appreciate, maybe not on the deepest level of understanding, but to appreciate our relationship we have with God, appreciate what God is doing in the world, and hopefully it will get my heart on board that I want to dedicate myself to God. Not only my, am I giving Hashem my thought, speech, and action, my behavior, but I'm also saying I want my, my, um, my, my feelings of my heart to be dedicated and loyal to the same goal. So that's an incredible uh, goal to achieve. 
And the fact is that if you properly have that meditation, if you're going to have these thoughts, you will reach that conclusion. Because if you think deeply about God, you will come to the feelings of love and awe and reverence. So we have to have the right meditation, but eventually that will be the conclusion. So eventually, the, going back to the metaphor of the rubber band, the rubber band will have more slack and it won't be that uncomfortable because you're getting your emotions to be on board and on the same level as that um, behavior. So that's, it's an emotional attachment that motivates you to do the right thing. Instead of it just being the behavior <clears throat> to do the right thing, it's the, uh, um, more of an emotion that's propelling you forward. And the way to get that emotion is going to be through the meditation, as we'll see in chapter 16 and 17. <clears throat> Another point, and then we'll, we'll delve inside. There is a, a beautiful, uh, I'm just going to take time to explain this. Um, there is a beautiful quote from, if I'm not mistaken, it's the Midrash. Um, actually, we'll, we'll see the source exactly inside. It's from the sages. We'll see the source. But it says these words, Machshava tova hakadesh baruchu mitzarfa lemaisa. What, what this means is, A good thought, God considers as if it's an action. Simply what that means. I remember I grew up on, on a corner. My, my home growing up in Montreal was on a corner of a, of a block. And we lived right across the street from a, a mall. It wasn't that active of a mall. It was pretty vacant. But there were still some people that would go shopping there, groceries, etc. And I would sit by the window. I was pretty bored some days. Uh, on, and, and I would just watch, uh, there were snow blowers coming to take away the snow and whatever. I would just watch by the window for uh, an hour. And I remember seeing an older lady. It was in the snow. She was struggling with her groceries coming out of the mall and she was trying to cross the street and it was windy and I was in my home. I saw her and I was like, I have a chance for a mitzvah. I, I must have been seven. I put on my coat and it was really literally just out by my steps and I, I ran outside and I, yeah, I, I asked her, could I, and I put on my, my coat, my boots and I ran outside. I was like, could I help you? And I was trying to help her with her groceries. Now, maybe it was my excitement. I didn't have a beard, so I couldn't have been that scary as a little kid, but she right away said, no, 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 I'm doing it myself. Maybe she thought, I, I, I don't know. It, it seemed I, I felt uncomfortable. I was trying to do a mitzvah. I was running with an excitement. And she was like, no, you're not helping. And I remember coming back home. I mean, I was just going back up the steps, feeling a little down. And when my mom asked me why I'm down, I told her I was trying to help an older lady. And she said, no. So I got, I, my mother told me this brilliant teaching that a good thought God considers as if it's an action. If you genuinely wanted to help, Hashem counts it as if you actually did it. And I, I just remember that. And it's, we're going to learn it this week. That's a simple meaning. A good thought, God considers it as if you did it. But now the Alter Rebbe, in true Kabbalah and Hasidic style, the Alter Rebbe will actually understand the deeper meaning beyond, behind these words. Literally, the meaning of these words is, is, is I'm just going to translate it in, in, um, in English, the literal meaning. The way I translate it is a good thought God considers it as if you did the action. But literally it means a good thought, God combines it to action. The Hebrew word is not as if you did it, but it's mitzarfa lemaisa, combines it to action. So the Alter Rebbe is going to analyze that specific word of combining mitzarfa instead of as if you did it. And he explains like this, that in the second part of chapter 16, he's going to explain that a real emotion is visceral it's real it's, it's it's something it's in your flesh you feel it to give you an example if you have real love it's something you feel in your bones if you have real fear it's something that's there it's penetrating through you as an example um, some of you may have have experienced this if you're on a freeway or you're rolling through a stop sign and after you did the roll the California roll, is that what it's called? The roll through a stop sign, or you're speeding 10 miles, 20 miles over the speed limit. And then you see at the corner, there's actually a cop hiding 
in a cop car, your reaction is, oh no, like I'm gonna get pulled over, I'm gonna get a ticket. Um, that's something, it's, it's racing through your, through your bones, that feeling of fear. It's obviously just a couple hundred dollar ticket, whatever, but it's more, it's something you feel in your bones. Um, so that type of feeling is so real. It's like part of you. What about when you do a mitzvah? Do you have that same feeling of love as you have for, that you feel in your bones when you have a love for someone else? Or do you have that feeling of fear um, or, or um, for something that stands opposite of God? Do you have such a um, um, emotional uh, um, reaction or a fear of sin? Do you have such a feeling of hate towards that sin as you would of that cop car that, that, is, uh, that you're scared of the $200? So what we're, gonna, what, we're, what we're trying to get to in the second part of the chapter is really make those, that feeling that you have towards God, make it real, make it part of your action, make it part of your bones, part of your being. So at least maybe not to reach the full deep level of a full love that is so intense and so real that you could cut it and it's felt up and down your, your body, but at least to have a, an, a, an appreciation of God that will get you such a, a better, deeper feeling of love and reverence when it comes to performing a mitzvah. And that the hope is that that love will be the motor behind doing it. So it's not the control that will be the motor. That's how we explained it before. The goal over here is to get the motor to be the, the feeling behind it, that you're fully on board, you're dedicated, you're doing it with a deep excitement and exhilaration um, to make it more palpable. So to think about it and eventually to get our heart feelings involved in it also. Okay, and the, and the final thing, just to wrap up this thing and then we're going to go inside, the cosmic impact of your mitzvah is incredible. We need to feel that, that when we do a mitzvah, the impact we're having on a, on a cosmic level is incredible. The same impact that a tzaddik can have by performing a mitzvah with deep love, we can have also. Why? Going back to that statement I said before, because a good thought if we have our meditation, even if it's not going to be as intensive a feeling as a tzaddik will have, but if we work with our meditation to get our emotions on board and to make it really palpable and a part of, a part of us, God will combine it with the action. God will combine it as if it's as natural as the tzaddik's feeling and as real and as um, uh, deep of the tzaddik, God will consider our meditation and our feeling to be as real also, meaning on a deeper level, it's not going to remain abstract. God combines our thoughts, combines it with an action, will, con will combine it with the, as if it's palpable part of us with a feeling of deep love. Um, as, as strong as it is by the tzaddiks. So that's my little intro as we're going to get into chapter 16 now inside. I'm going to pull it up on the screen. Um, but let's see, on the, on the book, I'll just open the book first, we'll be on page 188. And uh, for convenience sake, I'll pull it up on the screen also. Just what, what I've seen happens when I, when I share the screen, when I pull up the uh, online edition, it just starts talking, an audio version. So bear with me for a second. I'll also just take uh, questions. Oh, it's not talking yet. Good. Okay, here we go. Um, you know, first let me just take questions. Is it that Hashem has you go back to where, where when actions and emotions were equal? Um, no, Hashem just considers our uh, emotion to be as strong as an action, meaning as real as an action is by a tzaddik's feeling, it's so real that it, it leads to having that emotional drive on such a deep level, like, a, um, like his emotion, like, um, like his action, 
Hashem considers our emotions to also be as strong, even though we don't see it, but Hashem supports it. Hashem will combine them together. I was actually referring to, uh, um, like your friend that went to Yeshiva in Israel, and he... Um, out, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's at some point in his life where the emotions were as strong, if not stronger than the, than the actions and, and behaviors. The right? emotions, but, the emotions negative or positive? Positive. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking that, you know, as time goes by, it becomes uh, routine to him. And so when he falls out, wouldn't it that he would just go back to that time that he remembered where his his emotions were really into it and then he has to relearn from there so that's a good question and and, and what we're going to see in <clears throat> chapter 16 and 17 that it's it's a uh, it needs it needs um, effort to get that mind to think if a person is 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 just going about and waiting for a reactional a lot of times it's not going to be there it, it needs to be something something that he's proactive on meditating on so he keep he gets his mind on board and little by little it's going to change his feelings toward it but and um most of us don't do that we don't take the time for that meditation and that's where um eventually it just snaps but if we get our so the, i guess we'll see it inside i'll let the alter rebbe uh do the do the do the talking but it, it's a it's an amazing idea that it's really tapping into the deeper part where you could control yourself but eventually you, you could drop it also. And over here, we're trying to tap in a little deeper and say, let's be proactive to uh, give the rubber band some slack. So I don't, Yaakov, to, to respond, I don't think if, if, if we're not focused on that meditation, we, you're not naturally going to go back to that emotion to get you back in, on track. I don't think so. And I think that's going to be what we're going to be learning in chapter 16. Um, and from Isabel, but you didn't just think it, watching from the window. Oh, you acted right. That was... Uh, you put on all your clothes and went out. But, but was the mitzvah performed? No, meaning I didn't help the lady. Um, but Hashem considers as, as if I did. So you're right, I did an action, but the action wasn't the mitzvah. The action was my intent. I was just carrying out an intention still, but it was still, the mitzvah was not yet performed. So still God considers as if it's done. And like we said, the deeper meaning, the way the Alter Rebbe is learning it is, God considers my thoughts and I'd rather actually let, see the Alter Rebbe uh, explain it himself. I think he'll have good words. Um, and I don't think we'll get to it today, but I know it's a pretty good one. Uh, sitting and starting with an intention. Uh, yeah, exactly. Sitting and starting with an intention. Um, take time every day or a few, dedicate, dedicate a time, five minutes a week, to really be focused with the mind of uh, uh, an appreciation for God. And I think he'll give us some tips of how to get it started. But um, I, I mean, we'll, we'll see it inside. So I'll pull it up on the screen, if that's okay with everyone. And we'll try to uh, make sense of it. When meditation fails, your life's mission. Okay, could everyone see the screen? I hope so. Okay, here we go. In chapters 12 to 14, the Tanya has offered us a very detailed insight into the Bainini, which is presented as the realistic religious ideal for every person. When it comes to practical observance, the Bainini is a great success, but he struggles to maintain a steady emotional attachment to God. His feelings fluctuate between utter rapture, when his prayers and meditations go well, to thoughts of selfish animalistic behavior, which may bother him much of the time. The Tanya reassures us that all this is quite normal. Don't think you're crazy for having these. Make the screen a little bigger. When it comes to practical observance, both between man and God and between man and his fellow, we should expect nothing less than total self-control. But the emotional ride is going to be a roller coaster. Most of us will spend our lives with conflicting urges, a longing to worship God, alongside a desire to be selfish. When this range of feeling surfaces, it should not be cause for alarm. So don't think you're crazy for having urges. You're normal, it's healthy, it's natural. But we have to tap in a little deeper. And just in that parentheses that we said a couple lines ago, we said 
mitzvahs between man and God and between man and a fellow, we know that mitzvahs are divided. Some mitzvahs are really heaven-based, which means um, um, doing things just between you and God. When eating kosher, you're not doing anyone a favor by eating kosher. You're doing it between God asks you to do it. The same is with the mitzvah of tefillin or the mitz other mitzvahs. But then there's half the mitzvahs that are between you or Shabbat, let's say. But then there's half the mitzvahs that are between you and other people. Honoring your parents is honor to your parents. Giving charity. Those are mitzvahs in the Torah, but it, it takes place inter interpersonal between you and, and someone else. And when a lot of times our emotions are not there but for both types of mitzvahs, and that's normal. Sometimes you're selfish, but the solution proposed by the Tanya is, back inside, is to focus on the positive and stir up as much love and reverence for God as is possible. To make as many deposits in our emotional bank account as we can. Since the animal soul, which can never be really, uh, can never really be changed, will always pull us towards selfishness, we need to ensure that there is a strong pull in the other direction, towards God. And the way to do that, in the Tanya's view, is through prolonged and regular mindful meditation. So that's where we're going to introduce this regular meditation to ensure that we're, we're, we're on board, our mind and our heart. So let's see it inside. For Bainanim and those who seek to become Bainanim, the worship of God has this one all-encompassing principle. The main thing is to dominate and control the natural tendencies of the animal soul in the heart's left chamber. The all-encompassing principle is you must wrestle with your nature and seek to control it. As we saw in chapter 15, it's possible to have impeccable religious behavior and not be at war with the animal soul, either due to increased, uh, sorry, either due to decreased passions or persistent discipline. But that's not enough to worship God properly. Even if your animal soul has been tamed and trained to behave impeccably, in a certain area, you need to break your nature and do more. You can't just be content with um, a trained behavior of good you need to break yourself to be able to accomplish more. You are not expected to transform your animal soul to be your friend in worship. You just need to dominate and control its nature so that you can worship God. How is this achieved? Through the divine light, which shines upon your divine soul that rests in the brain. So we, have a, we know from chapter 9 already that the, the main center of our animal soul is in the left chamber of the heart. And the main center, the home base of the godly soul, is in the mind. So the divine light that shines upon the soul. your mic went out. <clears throat> no? Okay, hold on. That's it. Oh, you can hear me? Yep. Perfect, thank you. So this is great because I don't know where I exactly I got cut off, but the idea is that the, the home base of the, of the soul, of the godly soul, is in the mind. Did you hear that yet? Yes. Okay, good. And um, what the Yitzhahara tries to do, what we learned in chapter 12 and 13, the Yitzhahara might trouble the Benini in one of two ways. So here's the tricks of the Yitzhahara. As we learned in chapter 12, uh, sorry, A, number one, if he has complete mental focus to follow God's will, when urges arise from the Yitzhahara, it is re relatively easy to diffuse them since the brain rules over the heart. So they develop from the Yitzhahara, and you could diffuse them because you could control. But B, sometimes, especially when the Bainani is uninspired, the Yitzhahara can send him into a state of mental confusion. And he's unsure whether or not he wishes to follow God's will. He's, he's doubting. It is at this point, when the Bainani's inner flame is at its weakest, that his struggle is the greatest. So when he's inspired, and there's a lot of fuel in the furnace, a lot of wood, it's, he's on fire. He's, he's, he's praying. But then when he's weak, that's when there's a struggle. But God always offers him assistance in the form of light which shines upon the divine soul, which rests in the brain. And that is why the Bainani is always able to be in control of his behavior, even in his darkest moments where we said God supports him, God guides him through, and to use the mind to rule over the heart. When, while the Benini can expect God's assistance in times of confusion, it is preferable for him not to rely on that. So till now we were saying it's a reactive. You have an impulse, control it. 
and God's there to, to shine light to, to support you. If he's able to retain sufficient mental focus and the awareness that he wishes to follow God's will, he can rely on the mind's natural tendency to rule over the heart. This mental focus, however, does not come without the necessary preparations of meditation and prayer. So the goal is to be proactive in our meditation and the way to do, in, in, our, in our focus. And the way to do that is through meditation and prayer. So that's what he's going to explain on this page. This happens through mindful meditation on the greatness of God's blessed infinite light so that your powers for Bina, which is cognition, give rise to a spirit of Das which is recognition and reverence of God. So when you think of the greatness of God, that God is infinite, and you think of that in a, in a, in a power of cognition, which means you're, you're making it real with the power to, elaborate, to think elaborately on that, then you recognize it and you start feeling that, which is das, um, that feeling of reverence of God. As we learned in chapter three, das, which is, as we learned, just to review a little bit. So what's cool here, we spent many, many months from November all the way, I think, through March discussing the lexicon of Tanya, which is the lingo used, the framework, the ingredients that we're going to be putting together in this uh, uh, delicious uh, uh, dish. That's, we focused on the first cha eight chapters, understanding the, the terminology and the biology of the souls. And what we learned is that actually the acronym of Chabad is Chachma Bina and Das. Chachma is that initial idea, um, uh, the, uh, how do we translate it here? Chachma we translate it as inquiry, that initial idea, inquiring of, of something. Then you have Bina, which is the cognition and, and making sense of it. And then comes Das, which is more the recognition of it, applying it more. So Das, not adding anything new, it's not a deeper way of understanding it. It's just making that real, making that personal. So that's what he's saying here. Das does not add any new information, which was not fathomed by Bina or cognition. Rather, it fosters a mental attachment to the existing idea, making it real and relevant. That reverence of God in Das enables you to make the firm decision to turn away from evil, to avoid anything prohibited biblically or rabbinically, down to even a minor rabbinical prohibition, God forbid, so when you have this reverence that is really part of you um, with your recognition, you recognize um, God in your, in your personal parts of you, not just as a good understanding. A person could understand things outside of him, but not apply it to him. The goal over here, a person could give a great speech, but be, beyond that, he doesn't practice it. The point over here is he, he himself personalizes his idea. That's what Das is. So if a person is having the meditation and really applies it personally, then even to a minor detail of prohibition, it's all about if it's, if it's against God, I don't want any of it. Because you're making it yours. You're making it real. You're making it alive. In addition to reverence, a fear of distancing yourself from God through transgression, your meditation should generate the positive feelings of love. So it, initially, you're going to have this feeling of reverence, respect. Anything that is not for God, I don't want. But eventually that will also lead to a feeling of love. And love of God will be generated in your heart, in its right chamber where the divine soul rests. So if you remember before, I was saying you the home base of the godly soul is in the mind, but from the mind it goes into the heart, but specifically to the right chamber of the heart. Because we said the left chamber is uh, the, the home base of the animal soul. The right chamber of the heart is the home base, is the... Uh, extension of the godly soul and that's where the tension is in the heart the battle uh, the showdown takes place between those two souls so over here we're working on the love that comes into the heart in this right chamber where the divine soul rests with fervor and desire to attach yourself to him through observing the biblical and rabbinic mitzvahs and the study of torah which is equal to them all uh, for detailed meditations to arouse love and reverence see below chapters 41 50 so we're definitely in for the long haul. We're in chapter 16 now. When we get to chapter 41, all the way through chapter 50, he actually, the Alter Rebbe will actually give us several meditations that will help um, uh, make this love and reverence for God a reality. So I will give you a shortened version of it next week, some of the meditations 
uh, the way uh, as a fast forward for what's coming up in, in the later chapters. Um, but for now, we'll just continue section two. Would love to get through it, but I will give you some meditations uh, to ponder. When meditation isn't working, the above description of the Bainini struggle in life is more or less a summary of what has been stated in previous chapters. That's really from chapter 15, uh, getting our mind on board also. But there is an additional second all-encompassing principle of worship for Bainanim that you need to know. Central to the religious life of the Bainani is the ability to generate real feelings for God through meditation. But what happens if you employ all the correct techniques and despite all your efforts, strong feelings don't come? which means you're meditating, but the feelings um, uh, are, are blocked. So in Yiddish, there's a term, farshtapt. It's blocked, meaning from the mind to get to the heart, it's somewhere stuck. It's not making its way through. In Hebrew, the, the term is timtum, which means like a, a blockage. Some, there's a kink in the pipe that's not letting those minds and, and meditations develop the feelings. And try as you may, you're like, it's not working. So the additional principle tells you how to react if even after doing all the appropriate meditations, your intellectual capacity and cognitive focus prove insufficient to generate a love of God tangibly in your heart, which means you can't feel it, that your heart should burn like a flaming fire. That's from King Solomon in the, the book of Psalms. And desire intensely with a palpable desire, craving and longing in your heart to attach yourself to him. You carry out all the meditations advised by the Tanya at length, trying your best to generate a powerful excitement for God, but it doesn't happen. Rather, the love remains concealed and stuck in your brain and in your hidden places in the heart. Your heart does feel, does feel it, but in a less excited, muted fashion. So this is um, just to stop, to pause with a joke. We know the, oh, hold on one second. Listen. We know the story of the rabbi who's speaking at in Shul of the importance to have patience when it comes to education, the importance of, of speaking to every child on their level and not uh, speaking impulsively with them, but really being patient and kind and gentle and loving with them. And he gives a beautiful sermon. People applaud, rise, standing ovation. And he goes outside um, before Musaf and he sees children that the newly paved um, 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 front parking driveway of the, of the synagogue, the children were actually writing their names and writing some words in the, in, in the, in the concrete that was not yet dried. And that's so annoying because it's going to be there forever. And the shul, he wants to give off a good impression, of course, and he spent good money, the rabbi did. So he sees the kids signing their names in, this con in the, the concrete and he starts yelling at them, you good for nothings, you mazikim, which is like the Yiddish terms for you, uh, all you do is damage things and you're a bunch of rushas. He's going on and on yelling at these kids where 30 seconds ago he was in show talking uh, so nice about patience. So the wife, the rabbitson comes out and says, you were just, how, how could you talk this way? He says, what are you talking about? I was talking in the abstract, not in the concrete meaning in an abstract way, of course, but in a concrete, it's a whole different story. So over here, you could have these meditations, but it remains abstract. And the goal needs to be that you apply it in the concrete. It's das, it's personal, it's real. But what happens when you go into the Rebbe and you tell him, I'm trying, and the meditations, I've got all the good tips to think of the greatness of God, but it's not working to inspire me and de to dedicate with loyalty my feelings and my, my inner um, soul. So here we're going to see uh, how to develop it. Um, we're on the top of the page. Muted fashion, hidden places, concealed and stuck. Except it makes sense for, to you to worship God, but you don't feel hungry for it. That's good. That's a good line. Your mind's inquiry and, cogn and cognition of God's infinite blessed greatness does register in your heart. And your heart recognizes that in his presence, everything 
is considered zero, meaning there's nothing that can compare to God. But the problem here is that your feeling is more like a consent and approval rather than an actual excitement. You understand it, but it's not making you motivated as a going forward. Um, therefore, you feel it's appropriate that every living thing should yearn for him to connect with his light and be absorbed in it. Feeling that something is appropriate is not a very strong emotion. It's the appropriate thing to do, but you're not really, you're dra you could drag yourself to do the appropriate thing, even if you're not interested. You want to get your emotion driven into it. You agree that every living thing stands in God's presence and should be drawn to him, but you don't actually feel drawn yourself in a powerful, emotive sense. So this is like really great stuff, how to get your, your feeling on board when, when you don't feel it. And let's just see a question. Um, is it about surrendering to God's will versus my will? Yeah, that's a, a great way to say it. So till now, until chapter five, through chapter 15, Maddie, we were talking about the ability to surrender our behavior, that my thought, speech, and action could be surrendered to God. But now we're going beyond it and say eventually that surrender gets exhausting. <clears throat> what we also want to surrender is my feelings. I want my feelings to be dedicated to God. That it's not I'm going to do the right thing, but my heart is somewhere else. Or even my heart understands and um, knows that this is appropriate, but you're not propelled with this love and feeling of excitement and exhilaration to do the mitzvah. And that's a fact. When we do mitzvahs, we do it. But how excited are we to do a mitzvah as much as when we finally see the love of our life that we could feel it in our bones? So I know it's the right thing to do. And it's the appropriate thing to do. But you're not all in with this passion and love. And that's normal. But what we're going to try to do is make that a reality. Because when you surrender, when your emotions are on board, the behavior is so much easier and less exhaustive to, uh, to follow through. So it's about surrendering. So actually, um, and Maddie, and we spoke about this at length months ago, surrender is a great word. It's not an act of weakness. Surrender is the power to give up from yourself to someone else. But at some point when you just surrender with um, the feeling of, I still want what I want, but I'll do what you want, Eventually, how long could that surrender last for? So what we're trying to get to is a deeper level of surrender, which is surrendering our emotions, to get our emotions on board. Like with any spouse or relationship, to have that feeling that I'm not just doing it because I made a commitment to her or him. I'm doing it because I love it. And then you do it with a whole, you, when, you, when you'll take out the garbage, you'll hop and skip because it's not about the garbage being taken out. It's about connecting with my spouse. And that's a whole deeper level. Yeah, and, and uh, oh, so the fake it till you make it, that really was the four, right? That was get your, get your behavior even if you're not feeling it. But over here, I think we're tapping into the deeper level of beyond the faking. It's getting our emotions to love it also. So it's not, not just doing it. It's doing it with our deeper meaning and emotion. And then the doing it is on such a deeper level. So even if we're not going to have the deepest level of feeling, like a tzaddik, but us striving for that meditation and feeling, God will consider it as if it was done. God will consider it as if our emotions were fully on board. That we're going to see at the end of the chapter. Um, so the fake until you make it is before. And now I think Alter Rebbe says, you can't live your whole life on that. You need to start that way. Do the right thing, even if you're not feeling it. But now we're saying, let's get the feeling on board also. Hashem's will is that, you're, uh, that our will is equal to his will. Exactly. That's from Ethics of the Fathers. Good quote, Yaakov. Um, and and it, that's, that's the secret to, to any relationship is you could do things for the other person, but eventually when you're not feeling it anymore, you'll stop. But when, you, when you're in sync on your wills, a lot of times you do the thing naturally, even without them asking for it to be done. Because you're... you're, you're you're thinking the same things. So the way that thinking happens is by constantly communicating with each other that you know how the other person thinks. So that naturally will lead to you acting in the way that, that suits the other person best. 
Um, and it's not even a drag anymore, it's a love. And that's where we're trying to get to over here. So I would imagine as we truly connect and feel a glimpse at the connection and inner peace, it becomes compelling and exciting. Exactly, a glimpse of the connection, exactly, yes. Um, it becomes compelling, it becomes exhilarating. So when we need to connect on that deeper level, and then we have that feeling. And the connecting is that mind and getting the feelings on board. Awesome, yeah, good stuff. All right, we have, we're getting through it together. Um, so let's see, at the bottom of the page, um, I lost track of where we're up to in the paper book. I think it's like 192 or something. Yeah, something like that. But we're going to continue on the Kindle for those following in the bottom paragraph. And on a personal level, you feel that it's appropriate that your nefesh and ruach, soul powers within you, ought to yearn for him with fervor and desire to break out of their bodily containment so as to be attached to him unrestrainedly. It's a good word, unrestrainedly. Let's turn the page. And you understand that they only reside in your body against their will, bound in living widowhood. That's a, a quote from the prophet, um, uh, uh, from the book of Samuel, like a woman who is unable to remarry because her husband left her without a divorce. So that's a very uh, sensitive topic. And um, I, I know people, and it's a very tough thing, that actually the oldest document to support uh, and protect women is a ketubah. It's over three and a half thousand years old. Where in the olden days, in the non-Jewish world, people would marry and then be done and just marry someone else and leave the woman to fend for herself. So in order to protect a woman, a man had to make a commitment that if I'm, if I, I'm marrying her, I am promising to take care of her. It's called the ketubah. And therefore, when he wants to leave, he has to give her a get to... Uh, res um, uh, well, not resolve, to uh, remove his obligation. So it's called a get. So until he gives the get, she's um, that widow um, that that uh, is waiting for the get from her, that he, she, they're bound together still. And actually, it's a, it's a form of closure. I, mean, I know many people that after a civil divorce, they still want to make sure they get the uh, Jewish divorce, the get, because it, it brings a spiritual level of closure not to be running back to that, um, uh, um, in a, uh, that um, dangerous place. So the way we're saying here is, let's just go back just to make sure I understand where we're, the flow. So I understand that it's appropriate to yearn for God and to be attached to him unrestrainedly, but sometimes it could be, it resides in your body against their will. Again, this is largely an intellectual experience with a mere agreement of the heart. God's presence ought to be powerful and overwhelming. You just don't feel that way. So let's finish this final paragraph. And you agree with the idea discussed in chapter four that no thought of your soul can grasp him at all, except when, you are, when you're grasped by and dressed in the Torah and its mitzvot, as in the Torah, above illustration of hugging the king where there is no difference in the level of closeness and bonding achieved by the embrace, whether you hug him when he is, is dressed in one robe or dressed in several robes, since the king himself is inside them. Therefore, you feel that it's appropriate for your nefesh and ruach to hug God with all your heart, soul, and being, namely through observing the 613 mitzvot in action, speech and thought, thought referring in particular to understanding and knowledge of the Torah as mentioned above. So just to summarize, this final part, we know from chapter four that when I perform a mitzvah, you're making an incredible connection with, with God, that even if there's layers of separation, that you don't understand the depth of what you're doing, but it's like when you embrace a king, even if the king has all these garbs and cloaks and dresses and robes that he is dressed with, but the fact is you're embracing the king. So even if there's still a separation of clothing, uh, there's no difference of your closeness. You're still fully connected and, um, and fully one. So the same is also the, that you could agree with the idea and you know and understand that it's appropriate to hug God. But you need to tap into 
that feeling as well. I think that's the point of what we're trying to get to. Someone else could pop in if they have a, di a different understanding. But let me just under see the chat. Um, so I imagine as we truly connect and feel a glimpse, have I said that, is the get a document or a prayer. It's actually a document. It has to be written up by a scribe. It's a legal document that needs two witnesses there. And, um, and it's handed over from the man to the woman and she keeps it in her possession. Um, yeah, so it's a document. And um, yeah, there's a w words that he has to say, saying I'm separating and my responsibility is dissolved. But um, the main thing is the document. There's a document to get married. It's called the Ketubah. So there's also a document. Oh, Maddie, that's a great question. It actually, uh, just like marriage, it has to be consensual. It has to be by both. Divorce also has to be by bo both, meaning they have to be both in agreement. But it's specifically the husband that has to give it to the wife because uh, he's the one, and this is going back from ancient times, he's the one that promised to take care of her. Literally, the wording he puts in the Ketubah is I'm going to give the shirt off my back to make sure my wife has what she needs. That's the words in the in the in the in the in the document in the ketubah. So when he when 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 um, when the divorce happens, he needs to absolve himself from that obligation. Obviously, they're now with uh, custody and, and um, legal um, uh, alimony and, and obligations of support that may still exist. But um, um, the, the actual feeding her um, will be absolved once he gives it to her. Um, so that is, it's, it's a pretty, we'll stop with this, so I'll, I'll stop on sharing because we're, we're done with the screen, but it, it's a, it is a very sensitive topic. It was, it was meant with a very positive view that we need to make sure that she is protected and supported. So um, that's where it started from. Unfortunately, now there are sick people that want to uh, exploit that, and there are men that, that hold the get as a chip and say, oh, I'll give it to you if you... Um, uh, give me this and that, and, and it's a disgusting thing. It's an absolute uh, in Yiddish. We would say shanda. But um, and is it only from anti women? Thank you so much, Rabbi. Everyone, great class. Okay, so we'll stop with that. Just know that um, uh, once we're talking about marriage and divorce, um, we uh, spiritually we married God at Sinai. God is considered the groom. We're considered His beautiful bride, and we made a commitment to each other. Now, thousands of years have passed since we saw our groom in a physical place with a temple, and we never gave up from finding him. And, and uh, we're never going to accept a get from God, God forbid. So hence, we pray for the time when we will be reunited, not only on a more spiritual level, but physically we should be able to, as the prophets say, see God, that the flesh will see the the light of God will see God and we'll be able to just see the goodness of, of, of life and the, make the choices that are appropriate and the best one because it's going to be so obvious. May the time come speedily and let's meditate this week on our relationship with God and the closeness that we have. And um, yeah, we need that reminder, Maddie, that uh, we are married. All right, everyone have a great end of your week and enjoy your Wednesday.